Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're so glad to have you here. Um, we are Board Game Academics. We are an academic journal providing research, exploration, and practical solutions to everyday life, uh, especially higher education and the betterment of our society and the individuals. I'm so glad to have you join us because I think this is gonna be a fantastic presentation, especially what we're gonna be talking about today, which is the practical applications of tabletop gaming in higher education. So many of us, we've been college students, we work, go to different universities, and it turns out, of course, as we all are gamers, that tabletop gaming has a significant resource and benefit to our community at those college campuses. So today we're gonna be talking about different aspects of which tabletop gaming ha can have tremendous effects in the lives of college students and many, many more people in the community. So with that said, um, we'll start our presentation. I'd like to introduce Anthony Chaffield. Howdy. Um, so my name is Anthony Chatfield, uh, as, as Chris so kindly said, um, and I teach composition and rhetoric. I'm currently at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, um, but previously as well at Drexel University. And I'm going to talk about a course I developed at Drexel um, as part of the first year writing program there and was able to teach um, and, and implement and test and observe. Um, and sp basically putting board games in the classroom, doing this thing that we often talk about and then actually seeing what happens with it. So I'm going to talk through some of the like the goals of the course itself, like from a writing perspective, and then ultimately how games helped m fit that, um, like the, the, the mindset that had to go into it. Um, so this is my big long list of learning objectives that I'm given uh, when teaching a course, um, this specific course, which is the third of a first year writing program sequence. So there's usually six, there's three courses, they each have six objectives. Uh, and you know, obviously anything I create needs to match these. It's not just like, let's have fun and play games as much as I would love that to be the case. Um, but I bolded this stuff, like when I went through this, I'm like, can I make a game-based class that's actually doing what it's supposed to? And so I bolded the things that made sense, right? Um, critical reading and relevant research to support analysis of texts. Like we can do a critical reading of any type of text. Games can be a text. I'll get into a little bit. And this is something we're able to do. Um, rhetorical strategies and genres, tons of rhetorical strategies, genres, all games, you know, across the spectrum of, of different types of um, experiences, right? Respond productively to classmates' writing. Uh, obviously, there's the element of students sitting and, and giving feedback to each other, but games in particular are collaborative and a uh, group activity in a way that writing often is not. It's hard to get students to work together, um, even when you tell them they have to. <laughs> uh, games automatically put them in that mode where like, you have to play together, because otherwise you have nothing to write about, because you didn't play the game. right? Uh, and then the last one, my favorite uh, every term, and you know, sometimes the students will even snicker a little bit when I tell them this one, is develop a more positive attitude towards writing. Most of these students are not going to be writing <laughs> in their future careers. They're STEM majors, they're fashion majors, some of them, you know, they're all over the place, computer science majors. Um, they're taking it because they have to, right? It's a, it's a f required course for all freshmen. So that more positive attitude, sometimes I get lucky, but most of the time they're just like, yeah, I, I did my work, I got a grade, I'm happy. <laughs> so uh, making the actual course material, the text, the way you engage with them fun, engaging, interesting, um, was the main thing that got me going in this idea of like, well, let's use games because those do all those things for me. Maybe they will for the students. Um, so games themselves, right? I started, you know, doing some research, evaluating what other people have been doing. And in what I've seen and what I've now been able to observe in the classroom is that they are unique in a lot of ways, right? As a text, as an experience, as something to write about, very, very unique. Um, because they're experience driven, right? You have to do the thing, you have to play the game, you have to engage with other people to be able to write about it, to be able to do anything. You can't just skim through the book, you can't find the spark notes, you can't like go to a forum and read someone else's essay. You actually have to play the game. And if you don't, as the professor, I know you didn't <laughs> because I can tell you're just like taking other people's experiences and I can read the essays of the other people at the table with you and what they said happened. So. All these things happen, right? We get rhetorical analysis of the game itself and the experience. They help facilitate transfer. So if they're learning about, you know, how to analyze the, the 
multimodal nature of the game, like the visuals plus the, the written components in the rule book that can transfer forward to other um, skills. Um, critical analysis of systemic thinking, like we have games are complex systems. Even the simplest games have a lot going on in a way that more traditional texts sometimes do, sometimes don't, but from a purely mechanical standpoint, words on a page are words on a page, right? Um, experiential writing really helps combat repetition. Um, more recently, it's been very helpful in addressing this issue of chat GPT and AI and students being able to kind of just go formulate an essay with the help of a computer. Um, it's very, very hard to do that when you're writing about your own experiences because the AI isn't good at that, but also it doesn't know what you did. So it can't replicate that. Uh, and then this idea of the dependence on players to create rhetorical situation, which is a lot of what makes the course work. Um, so the experience that results from play, right? So we have the engagement of the players with the rules. They have to read the rules. When they come to class, they have to know the rules. They have to be ready to play the game. Um, but then we talk about unwritten rules, right? Like what's happening in this game that was not written down by the designer, that's outside of the framework of what we're being told. And then we talk about how that relates to things in the real world, right? Um, like, yeah, your professor didn't say that you, you know, couldn't write 4,300 words, but I think it's insinuated if they say they want five pages, they want five pages, right? It's an unspoken rule. Um, and so in games that happens a lot. Uh, representative systems to games themselves are often representative systems. Sometimes it's just like, here's a cool mechanic, let's have fun with it. But a lot of the time it's, you know, we're, we're farming, we're going on adventures, we're delving through this dungeon, whatever it might be. It's supposed to represent a thing. So getting them to think about like, what is representing what? And how is it doing that? How is it abstracting? Um, and then this idea that kind of just came from my writing pedagogy research of just communication as a dynamic whole, right? Communication is more than just words on a page. It's how they're said. It's how they're received. It's how they're engaged with. Like the rhetorical situation, broadly speaking, how do we engage with that? And games give like a very tactile way to talk about that. Like, what was it like to play this thing? How did it feel when this person beat you? How did it feel when this other person got kind of cranky? Like w all these different pieces can kind of be very tactile and, and specific without having to get into all the esoteric language of composition, which often puts freshmen to, speak, to sleep. So um, some of the concepts that kind of guide all this, um, the first one is this idea of procedural rhetoric that Ian Bogus um, kind of outlines. Uh, and he talks about it in video game format. Like a, a lot of his research is about video games, but it applies equally well to board games. This idea that the procedure, the act of going through and playing the game develops a rhetoric. It's persuasive in a way. It's got, causing us to think a certain way or do certain things. Sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, but either way we're having that discussion, we're analyzing, right? There's been a lot of conversation about how Puerto Rico asks its players to move these little brown discs around without thinking about what they represent, right? And currently in the last few years, asking us all as a society, like maybe we should think about what they represent. Um, Monopoly, which I'll mention a few times in this presentation. I know, I didn't think you get a presentation on Monopoly, but um, we have to engage the students and this is a game they've all played. So the Landlord's game, the original game upon which the Monopoly game that we play today is based, has a lot of commentary and, and procedural rhetoric to it. Like, Lizzie Maggie, when she developed it, was trying to get people to feel a certain way about the way the economy worked, right? Um, it's been bastardized a little bit over time, but that's how it started. Uh, we get into the unspoken rules. I use tic-tac-toe kind of as a starting point because it's so simple. You can, I, and what I do is I ask them as a class, like, tell me the rules of tic-tac-toe. Write them on the board. And, you know, it maybe takes five minutes and we get like two or three good sentences, a few bullet points, right? Like, there's a grid. One person's X's, one person's O's, whoever gets three in a row, they win, right? But there's unspoken rules too, like what about how long a turn should be, right? There's no agreed upon length of a turn for uh, uh, tic-tac-toe. And so Snyderman goes into this in his essay, Unwritten Rules, which I use in the class, about how there are always things that aren't mentioned in the rules. Like we've all had this, we've always had that person in the group who's like, the rules lawyer is like, well it doesn't say I can't do that. Um, Life is full of moments of it doesn't say I can't do that. And at the same time, you know you're not supposed to do that, right? So 
this is a super important concept um, for the students to get early. And they all, they all have fun with it, because then they start thinking ridiculous things you could do in tic-tac-toe, like, well, maybe uh, just never take my turn, and the game never ends. <laughs> like, there's no forfeit rule, right? So the unspoken part is super important. We're going to talk about how we're having these conversations. Um, ultimately, though, it comes back to this idea from Booth that board games represent a unique textual entity. You know, there's the thing itself, the stuff in the box, and then the player interaction with the stuff in the box. And only when you have all of that do you actually have a complete thing that you can talk about, right? We can't analyze a game for what it is without playing it. We could try, it'd be kind of dry, it's uninteresting, there's no experience to it. Um, so abstract representations suggest meaning, right? Um, you know, all the pieces of Monopoly originally meant something. They've changed over time to continue to mean something, to reflect something. Uh, tiles in Catan, you know, they're just hexes with pictures on them until you put them on the board and they create a map and they represent different locations and different types of resources that you can get. Uh, you just show somebody the picture of a mountain and they're like, hey, it's a pretty mountain. But you put it on the board and they, they roll that number that's on that mountain and all of a sudden they're getting stoned, right? It changes the meaning based on the abstraction that, that the game's asking us to, to kind of fall in line with. Um, so the player with the guidance of the rules and the designer will actualize the meaning of the text, right? Players can't do this by themselves. Uh, students can't do this by themselves. I ask them to sometimes. Like, we have the second week of class, I'll often put boxes in front of them. Like, tell me what you think this game does, right? And they look through the, the components. They don't have the rule books. I have those at the front, and they come up with something. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, well, there's dice, so you're probably moving. And I'm like, well, that's based on your knowledge of Monopoly, and there's no <laughs> board or tracks, so no, you're not moving. That's for combat. Um, or, or there's cubes, so maybe you're building something. And these are often students who've never played a Euro game, so they don't know cubes are often representative of all these different things in games. Uh, and then we get into what the things can actually represent, right? So a wooden block isn't an object or character until the player makes it into one, right? So we have cubes can be votes in 1960, right? Depending on the color. Um, they can be species and dominant species as you spread them across the map. They can be coal in brass um, that quickly disappears. They can be poop in dungeon pets. Uh, students love that one. Um, <laughs> uh, they can be little meeples uh, in Lords of Waterdeep that represent clerics and wizards and fighters and all that, all that good stuff until you replace them with the, the actual meeples, which look much better. Um, but it's all cubes, right? They're all the same size. They're all the, maybe different colors, but they all represent different things. Um, so this kind of gets us to the next idea, like from like, okay, anything could be anything depending on what the rules are and how you engage with them. But then how does that make us feel? How does it make us think, right? Because we want to analyze these things. This is a writing class. The whole point here is that we're writing about things. Um, so one of the games I bring in is Flashpoint, right? Which is pretty flat, right? We have a room, we have a house, like a cross section of the house. We have all these pieces represent fire and smoke. And we have the firefighters running around. And then you've got all the little stuff you're trying to save in the house, right? And you can't save all of it necessarily, right? This game is not quite as abstract as like a pandemic where you're letting thousands or millions of people die. It's one house and one family, right? And there's pets in there and people get upset, right? It very quickly <laughs> goes from this board to this, right? This is what they're seeing. This is what they're feeling. The, the responses that they give in their writing, they're like, I don't, I think I like this game because it made me kind of sad, right? Like the dog died. <laughs> it's not okay. <laughs> um, and so then we can like, okay, but it's you told me it's just a bunch of cardboard and plastic in a box, and now you're having these emotional responses to it because you did something with them. They represented a thing, right? Let's talk about how it did that. Let's talk about why it did that, and, and then we can start to have a conversation that turns into writing. Um, and. This, this turns into conversations of emergence. We talk about how games can kind of evolve from what they are, like King of Tokyo, we take a Yahtzee mechanic and all of a sudden we're fighting and yelling at each other and, and scratching and clawing and they get all sorts of wound up over this one. Um, quirky circuits, uh, just basic programming, they're moving around the board, they're cleaning things up, they get upset with each other. You broke the vase, you broke the vase. <laughs> like all you did was bump this one little plastic piece into one part of the booklet, right? Um, Pandemic is a great one. 
for a lot of reasons. Um, it's a very basic system. It's easy to teach. There's scholarship on it. Uh, Matt Leacock himself has done several speak speaking gigs on this. So it's him talking about how the game's been developed. So it's very helpful to kind of show the students, uh, the designers talking about it. Um, and then Monopoly itself, right? The simplest game, we, we bash it a lot. <laughs> but everybody's played it. This is the common denominator when we get into uh, especially 18-year-olds. In my experience, we get a handful who've maybe played Catan. One or two have played like a Ticket to Ride. Almost everybody's played Monopoly or the Game of Life. So I can use these as common references. Um, so from there, we talk about ideologies, like how these develop out of representative systems, right? So what's the ideology of the designer, the game, the, the culture in which the game was made? Um, and it, it's not to say that every single game and every decision has some ideology or some agenda behind it, but that there are things that influence how it was created, right? It was made in a time and a place and within a system that created this particular type of conversation, right? Similar to like when we talk about a novel, we don't say like, well, this author meant exactly this here and exactly this here, because we don't know, right, unless we talk to them. Um, but we want to get them out of this idea of like, it's never just a game. It can't just be a game, which, especially for students who hadn't played a lot of these things, they're like, it's, you roll a dice and move around, right? That's all we're doing, it's just a game. It's like, no, there's a lot more to it. Um, it's an expression of a particular perspective. It's a piece of art, we're having a conversation about it. Um, so we get into talks of like capitalism and colonialism in Catan. Uh, we talk about real world issues and how they're addressed. Uh, one week I bring in a bunch of games that address climate change uh, in various ways. And there's a lot of new ones coming out in the next year or two, which is interesting. But games like CO2 and 20th Century, um, Rescue Polar Bears makes everybody very sad. <laughs> um, <laughs> pandemic Rising Tide, which is not even necessarily about now, but it shows the impacts of that flooding. Um, I'm excited for Daybreak to add that to my curriculum next year. Uh, actually assign some reading for them about it, just here's how this game's being developed. Uh, but this is a topic that they care about and that we can talk about how they address those issues. Um, we talk about storytelling in games and how we can kind of replicate this immersive experience of fiction uh, through gameplay and how it kind of enhances that and can enhance that. Um, some examples of things we bring in or talk about. We don't necessarily play because we don't have four hours, but <laughs> Um, we can certainly, I bring the games in, they look at them, we talk about them. Uh, we talk about games that kind of go in the wrong direction with this and the problematic ways that they either address or refuse to address the issues within them, right? So I bring in Lewis and Clark and I ask them to like look through the components and how like these little red meeples are still in the game after multiple editions, why that decision was made, why we're still having this conversation. Um, we talk about Goa, Navigador, other games that have represent colonialism and, uh, and, and how that's presented in the games. Um, the next time I teach the course, I'm gonna bring in Mombasa and Skymines and just ask them to like, what's the difference here? Like, it's the same mechanical game, it feels roughly the same. We have two very different themes. Why did it need to be Mombasa, right? Why was that decision made? Or why was the decision made to change it? Um, just to have that conversation about like, the theme matters and why it impacts people as they're playing it. Uh, so when we get to this point here, like I give these examples, I bring them in, but we don't have time to play them. They're too long. They're too meaty uh, for them to sit down and play for that long. Um, so all I can do is bring them in. We can have the conversation. I can show the mechanics. But to actually talk about the impact of cultural and social rhetoric, I have to bring an example that they can play or have played. And so that's Monopoly, right? Um, and part of that is this is something that has stood the test of time. Right? It's a game that's almost 100 years on the market. Um, I show them clips from like the old Carol Burnett show, people yelling at each other of Monopoly. Um, there's a, a blackish clip, people yelling at each other of Monopoly. <laughs> we talk <laughs> about uh, the McDonald's Monopoly game and how pervasive that was um, once upon a time before people cheated. Or I guess <laughs> they cheated the whole time. Um, so let me skip past that. And then we get back to the origin of the game. Right? So it's been pervasive. It's been around for almost 100 years. We've all played it. Did you know this game is not what it actually started out as? Like the version you're playing is a variation of the alternative satirical version of Lizzie Maggie's original game, um, which many of them did not know. And many of them choose to write about because they find it very interesting. And we could talk about why she wanted to do this and what she was exploring and what social conditions looked like in the 20s that when she was developing this game and why she felt she needed to make this commentary. 
and how a game can make that commentary because it's asking people to do these things, to bankrupt their friends, um, or not in the case of the Landlord's game. So all this stuff kind of, it, I've played around with different structure, I put it in different orders, but I really have to like show them examples of how this is even possible before asking them to do it. Otherwise, I just get a lot of the same pushback that I even get from other faculty of just like, it's just games though, right? Like, you're just playing games? So what are you writing about? Like, the act of playing the game? Um, the course structure itself, I'll run through real quick just so people know how, like, what we're teaching or what I'm teaching. Um, there's a bunch of readings, so it's not just playing the games. They do bring in readings, there's videos, there's all excerpts from books that I bring in. Um, at least once a week in class, they'll be playing something. So I have a list of games, they sign up for them, I bring them in from my own library for now. <laughs> Hopefully, I can get the school to help me out there in the future. Um, but those games, and those have changed over time and have curated them to be things that A, can fit in an hour and 10 minutes, and B, that they can learn the night before and feel comfortable playing, because that is a problem. Um, every game they play, they have to make an, a journal entry. They talk about the act of playing it. They do some analysis based on a question I ask them. And then once per term, minimum, they have to play a game outside of class. So they have a group project, effectively. So uh, Drexel, at least, has the benefit of a board game cafe on campus. So I can just send them there. <laughs> it's like, they have a library, go in, ask them to teach you something. Um, but in other cases, you know, I can loan games out. The library has some options. Um, readings, like I said, there's a bunch of readings. So at least one per week, um, sometimes multiple. Um, stuff from Paul Booth, Jeffrey Engelstein, uh, uh, Eric Zimmerman, Katie Salen to get to Kimbis, uh, Steven Snyderman I mentioned, and then a lot of articles too talking about just like, hey, this game came out and it's making problem. You know, like the Atlantic had an article, the board games that ask you to reenact colonialism. That kind of gives a high level overview of this issue in context of that conversation in class. Um, the games that actually work in class tend to have a few things in common, right? Like we all have an idea of like what a gateway game is, but some of the gateway games I brought in were too much. Um, there were certain games they really didn't like. The crew, code names, a few others that just did not click because they were asking them to learn too many things at once. Like they have a baseline here of, again, monopoly. <laughs> so if, I, if I'm like, you gotta learn three new mechanics, they're like, nope, I'm out. And they check out and they hate it and then they write in their journal, I hated this. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's not helpful for anybody. Um, so single mechanic games, they ask them to learn one new thing, right? Um, emergent complexity, so things that kind of evolve over time. Um, I mentioned Quirky Circuits, that game does really well because the base rule is lay down cards, the program, move the thing around, and then you add new rules each time you play it. Magic Maze is another one that works really well because it's just very simple and you add more rules the more times you play it. Um, cooperative games are great, uh, especially the short ones because everybody can play them together. So if somebody doesn't get it, other people will help them. They're new enough that no one really gets upset with the alpha problem. Um, and I'm there, so if someone's really starting to take charge, I can interject and <laughs> ask them to sh like allow other people to make decisions. Um, I try to make you know games fun, sure, but then some that are just like relevant socially, like things that they might care about, like the, the climate change games, um, and then familiar experiences with added layers. Like King of Tokyo works because most of them have played Yahtzee, right? Like it's just Yahtzee with the dice, and then here's some other stuff you do, and you buy some cards. Like oh, I get it. Um, just some examples. So uh, party games usually do pretty well if they're not super long uh, or not too complicated. Um, smaller things, King of Tokyo, Point Salad, Hey, That's My Fish. No Thanks does really well. It's as a mean game, they, they love it. Um, especially with, like early in the term, they don't know each other. They're just going for it. Um, Ticket to Ride is very effective, and it fits exactly in that one hour time slot. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things that they come up with to talk about in that game that I would, even I hadn't really thought about. Like, who can afford to do this? I'm like, oh, good point. Who can't afford to do this? <laughs> Hop in a train and go all over the country. Um, some examples of text and stuff. So I mentioned a double entry journal. Uh, in class, I asked them to just take observations. So who won? How was the game? Who lost? Were you upset? Were somebody else upset? Did everybody play along? Um, you know, what happened in the, just like table talk stuff, but write it down. Uh, and then the analysis they do at home, that's the homework. And that's usually I give them some kind of query, right? So in this case, you know, does the game's theme appropriately reflect its subject? Um, this is an example one that I wrote for them. This is not a game I would ask them to play. Kotoku's a bit too long and complex, but just an example of something um, that I showed them, like, I want this. 400 words, two sections, right? Don't tell me the rules of the game. 
<laughs> they often want to tell me the rules of the game. I'm like, I know the rules of the game. Tell me what happened. Um, and they have to take pictures when they play. So when they turn in that journal, they need to reference the photos that they took while they played it. So when a student's absent, that way they can do it at home. right? Um, and they use Board Game Arena typically to do that uh, if, if they can't come into class. Uh, the writing assignments are pretty straightforward, right? We have a critical analysis of the first one, which they all know how to do. They've done it in English 101 and 102, but they're using the board game instead of a text, like a written text. Um, by the time it's due, they generally have a sense of what that means. Uh, and the second assignment is a research assignment. So this is like, go out and learn more about the game and its impact on society and how that all comes together, and, and that's what they do. Then um, the final is just a final portfolio. Like, give me all of your stuff, <laughs> everything you wrote this term. Uh, so some interesting things have gotten back, right? Like uh, one student did a critical analysis of Secret Hitler. <laughs> they found the game to be significantly problematic in many ways. And I said, okay, well, tell me why. Well, like, well it's obvious why. And I'm like, okay, in a thousand words, tell me why, <laughs> right? Um, so they do some research and uh, break down why this game was problematic um, through their, the lens that they've given. Uh, Fake Artist Goes to New York. It's one of the games we played early in the term. That uh, student wrote a really interesting critical analysis of this, um, drawing on like other people's experiences and some of the readings we had done. Uh, this student did a really, really interesting deep dive into Monopoly, like not just like, here's the background and history of the game, which I kind of went over in class, but like getting into like what things represent, and specifically the interactions between players and what those mean. Um, so I got, not only did I get pretty quality papers at the end of the term, but my attendance was through the roof. <laughs> like, <laughs> People actually came to class, which is, in a first year writing class, that's required and not really in their major. It's, that's not usually the case. <laughs> so um, there was strong engagement throughout. All right. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the term, the thing I want to leave them all with is just that all play means something. Right? If, if games have a purpose, they, they live in society. Johan Huizinga says, you know, all play means something. It represents how we interact with each other as a society and how we learn. And what can we learn from that in a broad sense? So um, that's my time. I'll All right. Pass it off to Will. All right. Can you hear me? Hit me next. There you go. Um, so I'll be talking about the work I do here at the Counseling Center at Johns Hopkins University. Um, that is my primary role. Um, I also have a private practice where I run games. Um, my name is Dr. William Nation. I am a trained counseling psychologist. Um, everybody calls me Will, so please do if we ever meet. Dr. Nation is my father, and also a weird thing that reminds me that I spent a lot of my time getting a PhD for some reason. <laughs> um, unclear whether it's worth it, but I get to play games for a living, so that's cool. Um, next. Um, so, um, about me, as I said, I have a PhD in counseling psychology. I do research on social isolation. That was my dissertation. Um, my dissertation collected data during the height of the pandemic, um, so I profited a lot from human suffering. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I guess, <laughs> but also I didn't make it happen. I was just there at the right time. Um, but uh, as far as expertise for me goes, uh, I've been a big nerd my entire life, um, obviously, as I'm sure many of us have. Um, I also have 10 plus years of playing uh, tabletop RPG experience. Um, started when I was in like high school and community college and you know, as a player first and then got into DMing and then of course I became a forever DM um, as one does. Um, I, for more than five years now, have been paid to facilitate tabletop games, um, largely things like Dungeons and Dragons and therapeutic spaces, um, although there have been other things like game nights and outreaches and things like that. Um, and if you know anything about me, I respond to a variety of situations with GIFs. Um, I can put them in a PowerPoint presentation, which I think is a skill that not all people have um, from every presentation I've watched in my professional life. Um, well, yeah. Um, so, um, obviously, uh, going into therapy and things, um, predictably the things that are important to you, you talk about, right? Um, you can't escape being a dork and talking about it. If, as all of us know, we're all here, right? Um, and for me, really what happened was there's a lot of things I was interested in and not a lot of things that I could do with that. Um, you know, early on in being trained to be a head shrinker, um, a lot of the time they're teaching you like the real basic stuff, like, hmm, how does that make you feel? Tell me about your mother, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, which works, don't get me wrong, um, but if you're sitting across from somebody who's only using the classics, uh, you're gonna get bored real fast. Um, and one of the things I was noticing in my training was we would talk a lot about what was going on in pop culture and media at the time. So plenty of people came in when uh, The Haunting of Hill House came out and started talking about like trauma and talking about um, problematic family situations, right? 
Um, and it got me really thinking about like, how can I integrate this into my professional life? Um, so uh, as it happened, I was doing a training experience at a private practice where I'm from in Dallas. Um, and I was having a hard time getting clients to come in. You know, it was a slow wee month or whatever. And I went to my supervisor and said, hey, you know, I have some ideas of groups I might do um, to get people to get in the door. Because if you're seeing people consistently, they go for a group. That's multiple boxes you can check. Um, and I talked to my supervisor and I came up with this whole list of things of like, here are groups I've done. Here are things that are research supported. And at the very end was a tabletop game. Uh, group and the of course the pitch for it was like twice as long as the other ones um, So I was not subtle about it and my advisor looked at me dead in the face and was like It's obvious you want to run one of these. So why did you tell me about the other ones? And I was like, well, that's correct, but also like you were gonna say no, right? And she's like no do whatever you want. I don't care <laughs> which was great 10 out of 10 supervision um, and so that's what I did. I talked about it in a therapeutic space with my colleagues, um, and I actually ended up uh, running it with one of my colleagues who was also in training, um, who really helped me add a lot of things to uh, doing a tabletop RPG group in a therapeutic space. Um, and so for me, I just in start terms of doing it, I started running into other people that were doing it, <laughs> other people in psychology or other academic spaces. Um, and then, you know, now I'm doing it at the Johns Hopkins University Counseling Center, um, which has been a whole slightly different experience, I would say, but you know, it's a whole thing. Um, but similar to kind of what Anthony was talking about, like why would you use games in therapy, right? Um, we've all played games. Um, they're not only always the most uh, positive experiences. Um, you know, you roll in one at exactly the right time and uh, you die. <laughs> That's not a great thing to do in therapy, right? Um, well, actually, uh, maybe it is. Um, so originally this kind of sprang out of doing social skills work. Right? Plenty of people have a hard time talking to people, feel anxious, feel anxious in groups, um, don't know how to talk to people or how you'd want to do that ideally. Um, that's an easy get. What do you have to do in D&D? You have to talk to the other people present, right? Um, you could be silent, your character could be silent for a lot of times, but like you cannot successfully fail a tabletop RPG and never communicate. Um, so we force you to communicate, right? We trick you because it's fun and you're having a good time, hopefully. Um, but, you know, it was that. Um, but then you can get into a lot of other layers and nuance here. Things like folks with autism maybe struggle with the unwritten rules and the, the social cues and things. And we can make those very explicit in a tabletop game. Because if you do something that I like, I can give you advantage on a roll. If you do something I don't like and I think is not useful, I can give you disadvantage. You know, we can do these kinds of things. Um, also, um, we have ideas about, like, they might um, increase our ability to engage with ethical or moral quandaries, right? Um, you ever been in a group with people that uh, have different uh, character alignments? And one of them's like, let's burn down the orphanage. And the other one's like, no, that's <laughs> evil. You can't do that. And then they kill each other. And you know, you have a new party. Um, but that's a whole thing, right? Why morally can you not do something? You are in a game that has like rules, kind of. But like legitimately, you could burn down every orphanage you come to in D&D. Although I don't know why you would have that many orphanages. Um, probably because people are burning them down. Um, but... <laughs> You can make that work, right? Um, another thing is that um, there's this question for a lot of people that have been running games, tabletop games, board games, that it increases creativity. Um, the ability for people to imagine themselves as somebody else, to imagine a world outside of our own, sure. right? Because like, why would you create a tabletop world where you sit in an office and a, do a cubicle job for nine to five? Now that does exist, I'm quite sure. And you could play it, it might even be a good time, but generally people imagine a fantastical world that is different from their own, which helps you be flexible. Um, also team building, increasing connection, right? If you sit around with people, um, assuming they all don't suck, if you play a tabletop RPG with people for a long enough time, you will probably start to like them or at least tolerate them. That is good. If you can tolerate people, we can do something with that <laughs> therapeutically. Um, another thing too is it also ex allows people to explore traumas. Um, so this is Sort of one of the tricks to it is that it's a, a trauma that maybe happened to your character and not to you. Um, so the example I always give, I had a client who had experienced really significant religious trauma, um, was raised in a certain religious tradition and really had a hard time talking about it because the country world we live in has a lot of religious people in it that don't really want to hear it um, or non-religious people that also don't want to hear it. Um, and so it was very easy for the client to come up with a situation for their character where they could talk about religious trauma in a way that didn't relate to themselves. So what they did was they created a character who's a druid, but they had been a cleric previously, and their god died. 
And so my God is dead, I have to respec and redo my whole life. And they're putting the pieces together, right? Um, and it was a really convenient way for the person to talk about something, things that had maybe really happened to them, although their God didn't die as far as I know. Um, but able to talk about things in a way that made sense and also felt safe for them. Um, and in terms of research, um, we know that tabletop gaming um, in a lot of stripes, but especially tabletop RPGs, we have research that tells us they do things. Um, it increases creativity with even minimal exposure. If you let people create a character in a tabletop RPG and let them play like one session, a session zero maybe, they will be more creative long term, far after you originally taught them to do it. I couldn't quite tell you why the mechanism of that is, but it's true. Um, it promotes attitude change, a 0.69 correlation. And if you have taken any statistical class or any social science, 0.69 like might as well be universe ending in terms of social science. Like if you can find anything that, you know, 70% relates to this, like that's insane in social science. But it can promote attitude change. If I make you role play through a situation where you have to take a different moral or attitudinal decision than you normally would make, you are forced to think about it. You are forced to experience the consequences of that action potentially. Um, depending on how you're running it. And that can promote long-term attitude change. People that play tabletop RPGs tend to be more flexible with their attitudes. Um, not that that's always a good thing, but um, it can promote acceptance to change and things like that that are useful for therapy. Um, it also promotes pro-social behavior in the folks on the autism spectrum. So pro-social behavior being like starting a conversation, checking in with your peers, how are they doing, um, seeding time effectively and sharing spaces, those kinds of things. Um, and then finally, um, it produces, po produces positive moral development. So especially for young folks that are having a hard time maybe morally working through stuff, um, you can have them play a tabletop RPG, put them in complex situations where they aren't going to experience any real actual harm or harm anyone, and they'll do something with that. All right, so I've talked about all the things that we can do with it. Um, so how do we actually use these things, right? Because uh, it's one thing to just be like, ah, create a character and let's roll some dice about it, which is kind of what we do. Um, but there's a lot of different ways you might do this. Um, one of them, one of the ones I use most often here is groups. Um, sometimes you can target them towards certain groups of people, like say a group for folks on the autism spectrum or a group exclusively for social anxiety. Um, sometimes they're more general, whoever shows up. Um, you can run a full campaign like this. That's what I do. Um, I run a full campaign in a custom world that I've created um, and we just go front to back and people join and leave and that's just how it works. Um, but you can also do things like individual or solo play or just do the character creation part of a tabletop game. Um, I've worked with a lot of people. Um, I worked with somebody who had social anxiety and what they wanted to do was go back and rewind and redo things so they could see if they could do it better. So we would practice social skills, like, oh, go talk to the guard and do this. Oh, okay, I don't like how I did that. Let's rewind it and do it again. Okay. Um, you can't do that in real life, usually, um, but you can do it in a tabletop space. Like, as long as I have the patience to pretend to be this guard 18 <laughs> times, we'll do it. Um, you can do that in solo. You can also ask people to create characters. Um, the spoilers of this is whenever you create a character in anything, you're creating something of yourself. Um, Generally, that's how humans operate, um, although sometimes you make yourself taller or more of an elf or you're like a gigantic orc or something. Uh, but generally, some part of you is in that character. The example I always use is I played a character that was a warlock whose whole character trait that was most obvious was curiosity and like to a fault, right? Um, I'm not that curious, but curiosity in a professional and personal sense is something that's part of my life. So it was easy to connect to that character, right? Um, you can make modules for specific skills. How do you talk to people? You just run this thing where you talk to people and it's usually how to do it, right? How do you uh, solve moral quandaries in situations? You can do that. Um, there are whole games that are created just exclusively therapeutic. Um, Critical Core is a good example. Um, it was released uh, last year, year and a half ago. Um, there are several more that are being created currently that are games built from the ground up to be a tabletop game that is used in a therapeutic sense. Um, there are also groups for parents, right? How do I teach my kid to do something? How do I engage with the things my kid likes? You can do a group with parents and get them to understand certain things. Um, and one thing I like from this is uh, somebody was quoted in an article talking about uh, tabletop games, and their quote was that tabletop games, uh, especially RPGs, are a vehicle, not a destination in a therapeutic sense. So the point isn't to play the game. The game is a way for us to get to whatever our point actually is going to be. Um, and hopefully you have some fun along the way. 
So with that being said, I'll kind of give you a specific version. This is how I use them. Um, uh, disclaimer that other people use them quite differently, and so you might get totally different versions depending on who you talk to. Um, but for me at the Counseling Center, I work with college students, so um, we have limited access to people, limited access to resources, so you do what you can. Um, so I run two hour sessions per week, um, split between in-game action, literally playing the game, um, and a more traditional process group where you sit around and react to things and decompress about events that happened. Um, the good part is that we get the opportunity to do this in relation to what happened in the game, similar to kind of what Anthony talked about with playing the game. We do that same kind of thing. Like, oh, this person behaved this way in this situation. Maybe you ask them about it. Maybe you talk to them about it. Maybe you ask other people how they're gonna react to what you did in the game. Did this seem okay? Was this too much? Was it too little? And you give each other feedback. Um, I run it with two facilitators. Um, one is the DM, one is a player. Um, the specific need for this, you can do one with just the DM, because um, don't make a, a client DM the game for you. That seems real rude. Um, but you could. Um, but we do it as a team because the person that's a player can help us kind of stir the pot in interesting ways. Um, so for example, when I ran it with a colleague, he played a bard. And so he would do situations where he would get the party into stuff, and then he would disappear. <laughs> and he wouldn't help them. And so then it's like, oh, great, the bard did this thing. And then now you have to respond to what he does, um, which didn't make him the most likable person in the group. But uh, that was his problem, not mine. Uh, so but it's a thing where you can kind of create that. Um, it also gives different perspectives, right? The things I'm looking for as someone who's running the game, I can get lost in the weeds of running a game. If everyone's DM, do you know what that's like? Um, so the person that's playing can kind of look out for different things. Um, also, it allows you to tailor situations. Um, so the way I do this is I create a season of content. Um, so there's an overarching plot. The big plot points are all the same. Uh, but the episodes are different and tailored to the group that we're in. So for example, if this group needs a lot more social skills stuff, they might be talking to people a lot more. If this group needs teamwork and coordination stuff, they might be talking about doing combat more or battle planning or things like that. Um, it also allows us to create useful or interesting situations for players specifically. So for example, we worked with somebody who had a really hard time taking responsibility for their actions. And so what we did was we gave them an item that was like, if you are not responsible for this, bad things will happen to everyone in the party, including you. You're responsible, you can't give it to anyone else. It's magical for some reason. Um, you can't do this, you cannot dodge responsibility. You can ask people to help you be responsible, but you can't dodge it. Okay. That changes how this person plays. It made them uncomfortable in some ways, certainly, and they were not a big fan of me sometimes for this <laughs> item, but like, mm, they had to act differently, right? Um, also, we tend to take breaks to process what's happened um, at the end of an arc or the end of a season. Um, so for example, if you're sitting down and like, oh, we just defeated the boss. Okay, let's take a little extra time. What worked, what didn't? What did people want to do more of, less of? Those kind of things. All right. So I'll tell you a little bit about sort of the premise of the game that I run. Um, and this is just what I've come up with from running the game a few times. Um, the idea is there's this world called Cadence, um, where the connection is a form of magic, right? So the bonds you have between people in your like old school 90s anime kind of a way, it's like friendship, power, yeah, that kind of thing, right? Um, yeah, I know, you know what kind of person I am just from reading this. And that's cool, we're, we're friends here, right? Um, but the idea is that like you can, your connections to people can be utilized in a magical way. So if you need to embody a trait that somebody has, you can invoke their memory or the idea of them to create that in a magical sense. Or sometimes you can even create a facsimile of someone you care about in a magical way to use some way that would be helpful or you know, utilize that connection. Um, and the idea here is that the first season focuses around a kingdom that is like decaying and the king is trapped in a magical situation where he's unable to kind of find himself mentally and emotionally. And so what you have to do once they figure it out is they have to go and find a way to reach him. And the way they can do that is by invoking the connections between themselves magically, in addition to their other skills, of course, um, or invoke the king's memories and relationships to other people in his life, which allows them a lot of freedom of choice, right? Um, do you remember this druid that you met and he had this quality. Do you think that would be useful here? Use that. Or, you know, they learn personal lore about the kingdom and they, you get to use that in some way. So a lot of players get different things. Um, also, spoilers, you can smash the evil wizard in the face if that is <laughs> your style as well. Um, but that's sort of the, the basic premise of the world that they're in. Um, and it's a, a slow burn. I don't just like open with like, 
magical friendships, yay. Um, although we do some of that. Uh, but we kind of give it a slow burn. You learn over time. Some people are more interested in it than others. And then eventually it's like, now put it all together at the end of that season. Um, and that's sort of the initial pitch. Um, if they get that far, we go into season two. There's other content, but uh, spoilers, no one ever gets that far. So <laughs> takes a long time if you're in a counseling center. Um, so um, how this works for me basically is you come in and you say, oh, I heard about doing this tabletop gaming group or D&D &D group as it gets called on campus. So much so that we literally changed the subtitle to be a D&D &D based group uh, because everybody knows Dungeons and Dragons despite the fact that they, uh, you know, yeah, sometimes do some things. Um, you know, like nuke their fan base from orbit. But they stop, so it's cool, right? There's a movie, it's cool. Um, <laughs> But the idea is they come in and they say, I want to be in this group. And so what they do, I meet and talk with them and say, hey, here's what will happen. Here's what it will look like. You know, is that sounding good? Um, we give them all the items they, they require. I have a whole bag of dice that I made Johns Hopkins University pay for, which is like one of the <laughs> proudest moments I've ever had. I'm just like, sack of dice. And they're like, I don't know, just put it on the card. I'm like, oh, there's a card? <laughs> Can I have it? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, but we also, you know, no experience required. Some, uh, some people come to the group having played uh, somewhat significantly. The majority of people are totally new, are people that are like, I don't know, like I saw it once, I played a one shot one time. One um, we get a lot is like, it was, that's that thing on Stranger Things, right? Yes, yes it is. Um, Vecna is not in the group though, just so you know, but. Um, and then once we have enough folks, we get together for a session zero. People create characters. It looks basically the same as uh, any other session zero. Um, we talk about boundaries and things, norms, what you would want to do. The only additional thing is like in a group, you talk about psychological safety. You talk about things we can and can't do in a therapeutic space, um, you know, about the rules of a space and what that might look like. But a lot of them are similar. Um, and uh, we also create characters, do all those things. Um, the image here is because uh, every game I've ever started in any tabletop RPG starts with a fire for some reason. Um, I swear I'm not a pyromaniac, but like <laughs> something is on fire all the time. <laughs> the rationale I give myself is that fire drives people directions. And as a DM, that's the thing you see sometimes. Right? Don't go there. It's on fire. Now, does that work? work? No, no. no. <laughs> because people are like, I'm going to run into the fire. And I'm like, Okay, now you're on fire. <laughs> like, now you have smoke inhalation damage. Like, what are you doing, man? Um, but it also is a moral test, right? Some people are like, oh, there's this thing on fire. I'm going to go save people. Some groups do that. Some groups are like, let's go rob people. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's an option in the game. Um, but you'll learn a lot about people, right? Um, and there's also a D&D informed consent that a colleague of mine created that I will show you that I think is really cool. So it's on the next slide here. Um, so this is what we use. Um, it's in the form of a useful table um, in Word format because, you know, look, I'm working with the colleagues I'm working with, okay? Um, <laughs> but the idea here is like, there are yeses and nos for what we do in this group, right? For humor, there will be poop jokes. People will make jokes about farts and dicks and stuff. That's cool, man, we're all adults. And also, there's no sexual content in the group. You can't joke about those kind of things. There's no de degradation, there's no bullying, right? Even if you're in a situation that's difficult, there's a line where like, I will tell you like, no, stop, you're over the line, right? Um, for combat, right, you fight monsters, bad guys, people get blowed up, people get their stuff chopped off, it happens. Um, but we don't do gore, we don't do torture, we don't do sadistic kind of things, which like, is a session zero thing anyway that happens for a lot of people, we just make it explicit here. Um, we talk about things, like there's no real world religion stuff in the group. Um, there will be analogs to things because in real fantasy worlds you can't get away from them. Like there's a church, right? Is it the Catholic church? No, it is not. Is it any other kind of real world? No, it's not. Um, there are things, but you know. We won't make fun of your spiritual beliefs if you have them. If you have specific things you don't want to see in the group, we talk about that. Um, we aren't gonna make real intricate M. Night Shyamalan plot twists, right? We aren't gonna be like, oh yes, you will have to remember this thing from like three and a half months ago in order to make this make sense. Like, no. I mean, I can't even do that because I don't remember what we did three and a half months ago. But, um, and there are gonna be consequences for actions. Your character can die. Um, if you do something incredibly stupid and your character dies, that's a you problem. We'll talk about it, but like, look, if you go around punching everybody you meet in the face, there will be consequences for that, right? Um, but we're not gonna shame people for playing poorly. Um, one of the informal agreements I talk to people about is like, I'm never gonna clown you in this group. Like, I'm never gonna create a situation where you look like a gigantic moron in front of people. Now, your character might miss or might fall or a bad thing might happen to them if you roll a one, for example. Um, but we're never gonna create a bad situation for you or punish you for playing suboptimally because like, 
especially if you're like actually engaging in the role play part of it, like everyone makes suboptimal decisions when you're playing a tabletop game, right? Uh, it can't be at least just me, right? So, um, if you're thinking about this, um, I would encourage you uh, to look at other options we have here in terms of other people doing this kind of work. Um, there's Game to Grow, um, the nonprofit that does this kind of stuff. Same thing, Bodana Group. Um, Take This is another one. They have publicly available uh, adventures that you can just purchase, um, you know, that are about mental health stuff and self care. Um, would recommend. Um, there's also a group of us on Facebook um, that get around, talk about doing therapeutic stuff, and you know, people that are interested can talk with us there. Uh, Geek Therapeutics, um, one of their representatives should be with us here later today. Yes, sir. Um, also, there's us, Board Game Academics. Also, if you are an academic or academic adjacent person that's interested in talking about this kind of content, um, you know, we have a journal, we're going to have a conference about it. Um, we have a table. Yeah, we have a table just out here. Um, so if you want to come see us, talk about it a little more, maybe uh, ask us any questions, there's that. Um, and also, uh, a good friend of mine uh, has created a game that is sort of like from the top, built to be sort of adjacent to a therapeutic situation called Emberwind. Um, so if you're interested in that, I would take a look at that as well. And then, uh, yeah, I uh, will pass off to Chris. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Christopher Carbone. I've spent 20 years as a career development professional helping students and the larger industrial, nonprofit, corporate community connect and make beneficial relationships that help support um, ongoing efforts to learn more about themselves, develop skills, and to be beneficial to the world at large. Now, that's kind of a big statement, and honestly, we'll get to how that all kind of comes together. But from a university or a college standpoint, when most students think about college, they think about, I'm gonna go to campus, I'm gonna hit the cafeteria, I'm gonna hit the gym, I'm going to hit all the different parties, gonna have a lot of fun, and then every once in a while, I'll go to class. Sorry, Anthony. Um, <laughs> but they will go to class every once in a while. So when, you, when I participate coming from all these different colleges, I, you know, I'm always out there at the open houses, and I'm always welcoming the students, and I'm always excited to meet new people because these young people are, in fact, our future, will make all the differences and the decisions to come. But oftentimes, when we talk about what is an education, typically we miss the fact that it's for the individual and for the individual to discover who they are as a person, their place in the world, and what they can do alongside others. Now, that's typically, maybe sometimes, a little too existential, a little too <laughs> big to kind of chew on. They want to get through their freshman year and such. So when we boil it down to the practical aspect, and oftentimes I have to talk about this because what is a career center Nobody knows what a career center is. We're the people all the way in the back that are there for your, what we would call, return on investment. You drop crazy <laughs> money at a university, you take on crazy loans, and we ensure that you have a wonderful job once you graduate. Now, all of us, and take a moment to think about it, right? We're all here to do something. We have purpose, we have meaning, we have value. And the way in which we show those things is through work. Work, often said, is like the one thing that we can do eight hours a week, five days a week, depending on our situation. Sometimes that's a little too much, but again, we'll leave that discussion until a little bit later. But it is through work that we're able to fully express our professionalness and our personhood in the world. Now, a career center, for many of you out there, does all these things. So a lot of the practical aspects is we'll do career counseling. Hi, how are you? And I'll talk about some of these elements here. We'll help you get jobs internships, resumes, interviewing, cover letters, connections to professional opportunities, professional associations, we'll do networking. Basically, anything that you wanted to know to take your career from the academic side and move it to the practical side, we're the people who do that. So all career centers interact with students and their alums on some matter of the different expertise and skills and abilities and resources here. So typically, when we think about what our individual career development, what our professional development might be, now you don't have to be a college student to go through this, we all have gone through this. Each of these different stages and steps help build your professional character. You take your passions, your joys, your love, your experience, your uniqueness, and we apply it in such a way that other people can see and recognize the value that you have in the world, but in particular, 
a particular industry, a particular career field, or just a particular area that really special to you might be growing. So now when we look at a person we typically, as an academic, we look at them as a major. But turns out for many students, and my students don't know this, when you graduate, nobody cares about what major you had, <laughs> right? True. You got a degree, awesome, good job. Now you can do something with that degree, get a job. Now when you get that job, what really comes into play there is what expertise and what experiences, especially the experiences that you had in the classroom, through the classroom, through the career center, and through organizations that really make you special, really make you proactive in that kind of process. And you could see an example of the different stages that we go through to kind of help develop you be the best professional possible. Now this is very linear and it works, but it turns out that what we really want to look at as an individual and as a professional going forward is all of these things come back around. So your professional growth is very much your vocational growth. So for some of us, there is a, there are a community out there, when we talk about vocations, they're typically thought of as religious vocations, personal dedications to a mission, to a, to a higher power, to a community to make things better. But for all of us, whether it's religious or secular or whatever kind of personal feelings, beliefs, and desires that we have, we are every day working towards that goal. Our vocational goal is a professional goal. It's a work goal. It's something that we work towards every day. And each step of that helps develop who we are as people. Now, if we're looking again from the practical aspect of all of this, if you're going to get a college degree, or if you've gotten a college degree, or you're in any level of education, we've all have some level of education, even if it's high school education, that is highly valuable out there in the world. Now, what is the valuable part of that? Well, there's a national organization of colleges and employers, as you can see here, called NACE. Now, NACE does all of these wonderful surveys and outreach to ask employers, what is the value of your new incoming employees? Why do you hire somebody versus not hiring somebody else? So you could see the different areas of expertise that are essential for your success. Now, some of these are built in the classroom. Some of these are actually built in because you were smart enough to go to the counseling center and develop who you are as a person as you process the life that comes because, you know, 18 to 22 or whatever age you were in college or university is a challenging time. So learning and developing, not just academically, but personally and integrating both of those is essential for your success. So what NACE really wants you to be able to do, what employers really want for all of us is to be career ready. How do you become career ready? Now we've all taken classes out there and we've learned things in those different classes and we come away with some information. Great, I know how to do a thing. I heard about a thing. I mean, when I graduated, I got my bachelor's degree in psychology and my family was like, wow, you did it. You're gonna go do counseling and be a therapist and do a thing. I'm like, uh, uh, no. <laughs> Turns out that the classes that we take and the bits of information education that we learn are only the beginning part of the process. It's the foundation. So if you do have friends or family or your own students that are going into college and you want to support them in their own individual success, what I may recommend to you, my friends, is something called tabletop gaming, <laughs> ironically enough. So along with Will, I have done the impossible and gotten ridiculous amounts of board games to the table, RPGs, dexterity games, uh, escape rooms, a whole bunch of different things out to the table because what I have found in my expertise of doing this for so many years, all my degrees in education is the theoretical foundations are essential, but you have to put them into some level of active, proactive, practical application. Now for many of us, we're not ready to get a job yet, we're maybe not even ready for an internship yet, but what we're ready to do is between the career counseling, where we get to know who you are, what you like to do, where you would like to be in the world, and what world would you like to see, alongside what active role you might want to have in a particular profession, 
right in between there is exploratory gaming. So what I've run in multiple colleges and universities is I've helped students pick out tabletop games, sometimes starting very simple with some easy process, and then move up to more practical dynamic games. So maybe you are a student that might think that business might be right for you, or maybe not, maybe it's completely foreign to you. Well, maybe you want to involve yourself in some of the economic games, whether it's a Euro game, 18 double X, maybe Brass, Brass Birmingham's big right now, number one board game, um, board game geek. Why don't you sit down and play it a little bit and see if those decisions are interesting for you. So when we look at exploratory gaming, what we're really looking at is different aspects of that kind of experience that could really engage students at a ground level so that they could be successful. So you can see here, I have also done the four E's. So instead of the four X's, we got four E's. So what we're looking at here is to engage students. How do you gain students? Well, unless you have classes like Anthony, you don't always have that dynamic process where you can get your hands dirty. What we want to do is provide a social activity so that when students go to colleges and universities, they feel like they built a community. I think a lot of students, and obviously your work will with your dissertation, is social isolation happens sometimes in communities, which is strange. It shouldn't happen that way, but sometimes large groups of people can actually make you draw within. Games, because you have the option of being very proactive, very extroverted, or very, very introverted. Play a Euro game. You ever see Euro gamers play? It's like the quietest, <laughs> just head down kind of dynamic you've ever seen. Like, are they having fun? Well, let me take a look. They're super quiet. They're focused. They're looking down. And they look like they're having a miserable time. They're loving it. So <laughs> that engagement is really helpful. Um, obviously, we want to explore new themes. Will talked about this, Alonso and Anthony. Who we are as individuals, especially college students, is very fluid. We don't know who we are. We're discovering new things about ourselves and playing different roles, whether it's genders, orientations, whether it's careers, uh, maybe making interesting decisions. I'm the CEO here. I'm a pirate here. I'm a farmer here. You know, I identify as this class, race, gender, orientation here. Trying out new things helps us explore different aspects of ourselves that we never knew that we have. And obviously representation is essential here because a lot of things that happen in professional career development and the professional world is we only see certain people in certain roles. So if we're going to challenge that, the best place to start that challenging is with the people at the table. Next we move on to education. Now what I do, I work with a lot of faculty and my job is to get professional practical career development into a classroom. Now, Anthony's really, you know, game for it, but most faculty aren't because they have a curriculum that they worked very hard on and very long for, and you're all awesome, but please let's pull some interactive, innovative aspects to it. So tabletop gaming allows you to play roles and do different things you may never have done before, but is still highly related to the curriculum you try and teach. You want to talk about slavery in the Civil War? Have you played Underground uh, Freedom, Underground Railroad? That game will change your life. If you've not played that game, it's a bunch of cubes. It looks as flat and boring as anything. And like second round in, you're like crying. <laughs> you're like, I can't believe we can't get those extra cubes on the table. It really crushes you in that way. And students need to experience that because that's what brings education to life. And finally, we want to entertain. Uh, it's about having fun. So much of life is about play. Do what you love and you never work a day of your life. That's the idea of what I try to do. Help you find something that you find is fun, entertaining, and engaging, and then we slip in, you getting paid. <laughs> that should be life. All right, next. Now, we see this in a lot of different ways, and I've had tremendous success with students. We've had an amazing turnout. Students want to come back. We're able to connect educational gaming back to the classroom, educational gaming to the library, educational gaming to the counseling center. And we've seen students react and understand different aspects of themselves they never did. I mean, for myself, I studied psychology. I was interested in sci-fi and fantasy. 
And then somehow I got tricked into playing Euro games. <laughs> and now I love moving little cubes for some particular reason. I never knew that I had an interest in supply chain management. And now I like doing supply chain management. But who knew? But again, if I would have played that earlier on, maybe I would have had a, a job in you know corporation doing supply chain management and loving it. But again, we want to expose students to as many different aspects of who they are as possible so that they can find who they are and find the place where they could do that best. Now, a lot of times this already happens in a lot of like upper level, very strict leadership. So you see simulation gaming, right? You see military strategists, right? A lot of those little you know figures on the board and they're moving the sticks and things like that. Or a lot of STEM gaming, STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, math. How do you engage populations that have never seen or never thought about doing programming? It's through gaming. So that's my little point, my little part of the college education community. And with my friends here at Board Gamers Academics, uh, we thank you for being here for our presentation. Um, you could follow us online here. You see our information up there. Uh, we do run an academic journal. So if you've ever thought about putting out research, content, any kind of materials, or you'd like to see more presentations like this, please check us out. Please follow us. Uh, we have a lot of academics, researchers, uh, practitioners, but a lot of great people that just are interested in getting more great games to the table. We'll have another presentation coming up, uh, Gaming Across the Spectrum, that's talking about gaming and mental health. And then tomorrow, Board Gamers Anonymous, our podcast that we talk about the latest and greatest in board gaming, fun board gaming, uh, we'll be doing a live podcast right here. So we hope that you join us again. Thank you, everybody. You said fun board gaming, as opposed to the other board game. Well, you, yeah. you haven't played an 18 double X game. No, I haven't, thank goodness. Please. Yeah. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, questions, for sure. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to run out of badge. Oh, yeah, you got it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just make Kool-Aid. Make Kool-Aid. What's up? Yes. Uh, yeah, so it's much closer to it goes until it has to. Um, so the, the the sublime joy of playing a tabletop RPG is that like combat that is 10 second rounds takes you three weeks and like a conversation that takes 10 minutes takes you two minutes. Like what? Um, the time dilation is super real. Um, I plan it out so on average you're talking about maybe five to eight sessions of like per small chapter. So that's like, you know, you know, uh, five or six weeks. The idea is to like smash it as much of it you can into a semester um, and the requisite holidays. So, you know, potentially if you have three or four chapters, you know, maybe that's like 15 to 20 weeks. Um, we do as best we can there. Um, of course, sometimes it just takes a lot longer. Sometimes it takes a lot uh, less time. It's just kind of relative. Feel free to send them my way if they're interested. Uh, I mean, speaking for myself, I, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I had to go through the same thing. I, yep. I wrote a very lengthy paper 
explaining, like, here's the research, both pedagogically and ludologically, like, that mm -hmm. this can work. Um, it was theory, but some people have done it. So, yeah. like, seeing how they've done it, and here's how I want to do it. Um, and thankfully, my administration was very supportive of that, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I taught at multiple schools, so I know that they're not always. Yeah. No, no, no we're in here. We have. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, they do interesting stuff. Yeah, it's the, for me. I was like, that's where I started, and then I just I really had to kind of adjust it to the point of like, the games are the texts that we're yeah. evaluating, right? Because. We're teaching them to write. They need a text to evaluate. I've chosen games, and here's why that makes sense. Um, rather than the games are going to help them learn how to write, because that that argument wasn't really working um, in the early conversations I had with like my advisors. But uh, if, if focusing more on like, oh no, here's the way, I here's what I want them to do. It's really based, and even to the students, I'll say like, this is an experience-based writing. You're writing about an experience that you've had. Mm -hmm. The experience that I've chosen for you is gaming, but. You know, this could apply to any experience. It could affect, you know, soccer or going to the arcade or playing Fortnite. Like, you could write an essay about that using what we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, and some of them did. Like, I had a student who had COVID who was out for three weeks, and he wrote about Fortnite, and it was good. Yeah. <laughs> so. Parking, second forever. Yeah. For the first like three or four weeks, yeah, because like <laughs> yeah, like if you just throw that them for like a week for a module, some of them are gonna be like, okay, like <laughs> this is nerdy stuff, and like in my head originally, the first time I taught it, I was thinking like, oh, this is cool, it'll go in the catalog and they'll be excited, and people who come to this class will actually care. Some did. <laughs> I had a few like video game design majors come to the course, mm -hmm. but a lot of them just like, it fit their schedule. So <laughs> You were on Wednesday at this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they come and they're like, wait, we're doing what? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Eventually. Yeah, and mental health generally. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah of course. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We have cards at our table if you want to come over yeah, and grab one. That. I'll get that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Course. Yeah, if you think of any more questions, we'll be yeah, out there. Yeah, for sure. And I've got social. Oh, yeah, you got to think about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and to your question about like talking to people, um, I know Chris and I have had the conversation several times about like one of the things that the collectively we have experience with is talking to people yeah. in those conversations. Not everybody does. And like part of what I do is like I have a whole PhD. People, for some people that is valuable. I'm not here to tell you that I think that that's like the end all be all of existence. But like if I can, if I can waltz into a Zoom meeting and for some reason someone's gonna take my opinion seriously more than somebody else's, part of what I do is like mouthpiecing for people that need it. And so if that's a thing that works for you, I'm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 